Have you ever been to space? I have in video games. And let me tell you, I've done so many things. Hell, just the other day, I was dogfighting with pirates in Eve Valkyrie. I've destroyed countless craft and looted the delicious scrap in FTL, and of course, engaged in complicated and nuanced interstellar diplomacy in Mass Effect. Big, stupid jellyfish. But one thing that has never happened to me ever in the history of playing space games is to be turned into a bloody, gooey mess of pulp on the back wall of my spaceship. Now, I know this may seem like a very strange thing to mention. However, not spending your future as a bloody mess of gooey pulp is a very real consideration if the science fiction space travel of video games were ever to become science fact in real life. And it's all down to something called inertia. Inertia, you see, is the resistance an object has to a change in momentum. That could be changing from still to moving, or changing direction while traveling in a straight line. Think of being in a car, for example. The faster you accelerate, the more force you feel. So when you accelerate in uh, a regular vehicle, um, you uh, go 0 to 60 in eight seconds. And the force you experience, you, you experience some force pushing you into the back of your seat. Now say you start accelerating, and then a second later, you're traveling at the speed you would be had you jumped off a building. The, the seat that you're sitting in is equivalent to, or would be traveling at the same speed as, the ground would be rushing up at you, you would just be squished. Pulp on the back of your seat. Ugh, nasty. So that's what can happen if you speed up almost instantaneously. But what level of force can people actually survive? What about real life astronauts? What do they go through when blasting off and traveling out through Earth's atmosphere? So when astronauts take off, they feel this big force pushing down on them, which is a combination of gravity and inertia, which most people know as g-force, though g-force is technically an acceleration. And it's that acceleration which makes you feel a force. It's a force on your body of about 3 to 4 g, um, which is enough that they can still move around and do things. As Elizabeth said, we commonly refer to this property of acceleration as g-force. In freefall, we would experience zero g, no gravity at all. Standing still, we experience 1g, one times the force of gravity. But as we start accelerating, we experience greater g-force, multiples of the force of gravity. Now, as g-force increases, so does our risk of dying. It becomes harder to move your limbs. Your organs get squashed down inside your body and blood gets forced away from your brain, causing you to black out and eventually perish. The body can withstand low amounts of g-force for extended periods of time, but in some cases we are also able to handle very high g-force so long as it's only very briefly. Back in the early 1950s, Colonel John Paul Stapp hopped on a rocket sled and found out the body can handle much, much greater loads for a short time. Traveling at over 630 miles per hour, he then slowed to a standstill in one second, pulling an incredible 46.2 Gs against his restraints. That's the equivalent of his body weighing over four tons. And you know what? He was fine. I mean, besides the broken ribs, broken wrists, huge blisters, and his retinas detaching from his eyes. Fine. Better, maybe. But what about blasting off to light speed almost instantaneously, as is often the case in games with light speed travel? Now, ignoring for a minute the technological hurdles of achieving this speed, the inertia you would feel from that acceleration wouldn't just turn you into a pile of bloody pulp in your chair. No, no, you would be little more than an atom-thick smear on the back wall. Okay then, but what if we approach that speed a little slower, or maybe a lot slower? Say we were to accelerate at 39 meters per second per second, a consistent 4G which modern day astronauts experience. Well, at that velocity, it would take around three months to reach near light speeds. And then of course, slowing down would take the same length of time. Three months to speed up, and then another three to slow down. That's like eight years. Now I've got things to do. Fortunately though, I might just have an idea. What if there was a force inside your ship pulling you towards the front at the same rate that the acceleration is pushing you to the back, effectively cancelling out the inertia problem? Well, the only force that could theoretically do this would be gravity, localized entirely inside your ship. 
easy, right James? The idea of creating a localised gravitational field to uh, offset the force which you would experience when your ship was accelerating very quickly uh, is a nice one because uh, gravity acts on all of the particles in your body equally. So as the ship is accelerating, you would be pulled along with the ship and every part of you would be pulled along with the same force. So the front of you wouldn't be crushed into the back of you um, and so each your front and your back would be experienced the same force and so you would not really feel any force at all. Um, however there is no way that we know of of creating localized gravitational fields. Oh well that's a bit of a bummer. Fortunately though games have found a way around this, notably Mass Effect. A combination of element zero and some convenient mass relays means that while the crew of the Normandy zip around the galaxy, no one feels a thing. Except feelings of hot, sexy alien lust. Guess I'm getting pretty good at this. So, is element zero a real thing? And could it reduce our inertia by solving our mass problem? Not that kind of problem. In game, it works by reducing the mass of the spaceship and its crew, therefore reducing the inertia they experience. So could this work? As far as we know, there is no way to decrease an object's mass. The only way that it might be possible is if somehow you can manipulate something called the Higgs field. Uh, Higgs boson's got a lot of press recently because it just got found at CERN. Um, and it's this that, that gives objects its mass. And if you could somehow manipulate this Higgs field to increase or decrease how strongly it's, it's called coupling, um, so how strongly it interacts, well, you could possibly change how that affects an object's mass. But that's very theoretical and we have no idea how to do it. Okay, so it seems mass effect can't really help us with our inertia problem, but what about actual theoretical physics? Another way that people have come up with is Rather than trying to use propellant to just make you go forward, you stay going at a fairly leisurely speed, but you change space-time around you. So you contract the space in front of you so that even though you're going at quite a leisurely walking pace, you're traveling through less of a distance until you get there and you look back and actually you've traveled through a billion kilometers. Again, how you would actually go about doing this is still incredibly theoretical. Theoretical it may be, but it's exactly the theory David Braben, creator of the now 30-year-old classic space sim Elite, has utilised for his brand new kick-started game, Elite Dangerous. What it's doing is it's compressing the world around you. So essentially the g-forces are still not prodigious. What it's doing is done doing some sort of warping of space in order to allow it. It also means you can see that the interrelation of the whole system you know, you can see planets, you fly past them and actually see it move in real time. And you just see the real beauty of these systems, you know, the, the, the sheer vastness of it. And then you can sort of drop back into sort of normal space and, and realise that, you just realise the vastness of the, the distance that you just covered. Well, let me know what you thought of this week's reality check. And my thanks once again to James, Elizabeth and David for helping out. Last week on the show, I explored the science of hardcore fans. GameSpot commenter Arcanels25 said, well, that explains the console war. And they're right. For a more detailed look at the psychology of console fans, check out the very first episode of Reality Check, Are You a Console Fanboy, for more. If you want to get in touch with me directly, maybe with a comment or to suggest a topic for Reality Check, the best way to do so is to find me on Twitter at CamFrazRob and send me a tweet. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next week.